Hello everyone, welcome to Global Government News. Today is Friday, March 16th, 2012, and I'm Darko. Alright, so you just saw a little video, quick brief video. I just threw that up there. I think it's a little bit of an older video, but either way, it does uh, give you some background when we get to this piece of propaganda. Worries over Iranian Jews if Israel attacks all but lost amid the heated talk about possible Israeli attack on Iran's suspected nuclear program are thousands of Jews who live in the Islamic Republic and could be caught in the middle. Although Iran has a history of treating its Jewish minority fairly well, some Iranian Jews who have uh, uh, some Iranian Jews who have emigrated to Israel worry that the Israeli attack could expose family and friends still in Iran to retaliation. Next up, we have most of Israel's security cabinet backs Iran strikes, says report. Remember, the um, I think it was ex-Mossad chief uh, basically saying that he's not for this. He's not on board uh, with uh, Israel strike in Iran. And it says here, a majority of Israel's security cabinet now supports an attack on Iran in a bid to end its nuclear program, an Israeli newspaper reported on Thursday. It said most of the 14-member security cabinet was now leaning in favor of a preemptive strike on Iran's nuclear facilities. Lieberman of Israel to China, all options on the table for Iran, foreign minister in China for high-level meetings, says he would prefer the international community. Ooh, I love that. The international community solve the Iranian nuke issue through talks, sanctions, adds Israel to continue dialogue with Beijing. So again, with the rhetoric that I was talking about on Wednesday about their, you know, in order to justify a preemptive strike, they have to say, we're being attacked. We have to go on the defense while they're actually going on the offense. I think it's our right to protect ourselves, to defend ourselves, Lieberman said. Prime Minister Iranian missiles may threaten UK. This is from March 7th, 2012. A nuclear arm Iran could pose a threat outside the Middle East due to the country's developing intercontinental missile technologies, Prime Minister David Cameron has warned. I don't believe that an Iranian nuclear weapon is just a threat to Israel. It is also clearly very dangerous for the region because it would trigger a nuclear arms race. A nuclear arms race, right? You know? Cameron, UK, would not support Israeli strike on Iran. So no matter all that, no matter what he said, just like in the United States where you have some of the um, heads of the military saying, and even the CIA, they don't have nuclear uh, capabilities and uh, they're not an imminent threat to us and we're not going to strike them. So Israel is standing alone here uh, doing it. But uh, you know that the UK and the US are going to support Israel as soon as they do a uh, strike or the USS Enterprise is sunk by design as planned for a false flag attack to uh, kind of kick this thing off. Uh, U.S. and Israel will be right behind them, but they just have to. So when we look back, we can say, "Oh, see, U.S. and and U.S. and uh, and U.K. they had nothing to do with it, and you know we we're just innocent little bystanders caught up in the middle." Navy to send more mine counter ships to Persian Gulf region. The U.S. Navy plans to bolster mine warfare forces in the Persian Gulf as tensions rise with Iran over its nuclear program and threats to block the Strait of Hormuz, according to a Senate testimony earlier this week. In addition to bulking up U.S. Navy forces, it says here uh, this individual Greener called for upgrades to submarine torpedoes, mine neutralization vehicles, optics, and weaponry to counter swarm tactics Iran might employ should a conflict break out, talking about closing of the Strait of Hormuz. Next up, U.S. threatens India with sanctions over Iran trade. I've covered this before. The United States has threatened to impose sanctions against India now if the South Asian country fails to reduce its purchase of crude oil from the Islamic Republic. If India fails to cut Iranian imports sufficiently, now remember that, to cut Iranian imports sufficiently, Obama may be compelled to bar access to the U.S. banking system for any Indian uh, bank processing oil payments through Iran's central bank. Bloomberg quoted the U.S. official as saying, and see, th we're seeing what uh, kind of like the buildup towards this global uh, system. I mean, it, it, we're almost already there, but there's still these individual countries that want to do what they want to do. Um, and they get slapped on the hand like little children. Well, this is the slap on the hand right here uh, from the parents, from the global elites and that, saying, you know, bad, bad India. And, you know, eventually you're not going to, you know, you're just going to get cut off. Like people are going to get cut off um, whether they have a chip in their in their head or they have like a physical something on their mobile phones like, um, you know, with credits or credit card they can purchase food. I mean, eventually you're going to get uh, cut out digitally. You're going to get cut out of the system off the grid and then you're going to try to survive off the grid and they're going to have all of these apparatuses and infrastructure set up to attack you while you're trying to survive off the grid.
Then I came across this article as well. India to spread tentacles into Central Asia via Iran. India is making a concerted push into Central Asia by taking charge of a crucial transportation network through Iran into the region and beyond. It's called the International North-South uh, Corridor. And it goes on here and it says it connects uh, ports on India's, India's west coast uh, to Bandar Abbas in Iran, then overland to a port in the Caspian Sea, then through Rash and Ashata and Azerbaijan border, onwards to Kazakhstan and further on towards Russia. So you know the West isn't going to like this. And it says, thanks to U.S. sanctions on Iran's oil sector, uh, India is finding it difficult to pay for its oil imports with hard currency. One of the best ways of paying for Iranian oil is through infrastructure projects like the corridor which serves economic and strategic interests of all states concerned so they're not exactly buying it they're just providing the services and the u.s doesn't like them circumventing that and iran does that a lot with things they're trying to circumvent all these sanctions azerbaijan arrests 22 of their own citizens for allegedly being iranian spies so i remember i covered this before but it says it announced they have arrested 22 of their own citizens who they claim are iranian spies Last month, Iran complained of, quote, creeping Zionist influence, end quote, in the Caucasus, a jab which was clearly aimed at Azerbaijan. This came after Azerbaijan signed a shockingly large $1.6 billion weapons deal with Israel, which I covered as well. And you can read through this article. It's pretty good. It's, but it says, like the alleged plots in both Georgia and India, these targets do not make much sense when one attempts to assume the mindset of a terrorist. There's little support for U.S. intervention in uh, the Syrian conflict. There's strong public sentiment against the U.S. intervening. Nearly two-thirds, 64 percent, said the U.S. does not have any responsibility to do something about the conflict in Syria. Remember, Libya, only 27 percent were for it, but they did it anyways. Congress threatens Obama impeachment if Syria is attacked. It's a kind of a misleading headline because it says Congress, but uh, so I had to go check it out. Uh, but when I found out, it was just one lone North Carolina congressman warned uh Obama that any military intervention in Syria without congressional approval might result in impeachment proceedings. I doubt the bill would advance beyond the House, but at least the president has been warned. And it goes down there comparing the forefathers and uh, you have to declare war. And it's just, uh, we're so past that uh, to even hear something like that is, um, it's just old school, right? Uh, who is that guy? Is, he must be some right-wing conspiracy theorist in Congress or something. Turkey considers Syria buffer zone. Anon seeks unity. So Turkey is uh, going to be setting up a buffer zone inside Syria to protect refugees fleeing Bashar al-Assad's forces, raising the prospect of foreign intervention along your revolt. Remember what I was talking about, about uh, uh, that article which states that if, uh, you know, if there's a flood of refugees going into Turkey to connect, use that as a legal precedent or basically it gives them uh, the go-ahead, the green light to go into Syria and intervene. So they don't have to necessarily declare war or anything. They just say, oh, it's a humanitarian conflict and in the name of humanitarianism, uh, we're going to start drone bombing you. So Kofi Annan, who's uh, part of the United Nations, the global government, is now part of the Arab League now. So yeah, I, I didn't know that, but I guess he is. He's part of the Arab. He speaks for the Arab League. He urged the Security Council to end its divisions over Syria and, and work to help a peace mission. So they always want peace, which can usually mean capitulation. So if you're a sovereign entity and you're being attacked by a f foreign external force or entity, um, you're going to fight. You're going to fight to the death. So for you, if you're that particular person with that mindset, there will be peace when you die. Unfortunately, you see it time and time again with so many countries, you know, Libya or the Native Americans. It's divide and conquer, and that's what they do. They, they divide people up, and they get them, you know, like what they're doing in North Korea, what they'll do in other places. Uh, they try to starve them and say, oh, we're going to retract your food aid, like in Somalia. We're going to take away your food aid if you don't comply, if you don't bring about peace. And if people could just give them the middle finger and say, we'll starve before we let you do what you're going to do and have your way with us. But unfortunately, the way I see it is people are going to get cut off that grid. And the people that are going to be cut off the grid, um, they're going to be a small minority, a very small minority. And there's going to be no way of really la uh, uh, you know, doing anything to bring this global um, uh, technotronic system to its knees. So Turkey has been a member of NATO since 1952 and kind of 
wrap, uh, going back to what I was saying, you know, a lot of these countries, especially when they're uh, smaller countries, they join NATO only so that they don't get attacked by NATO. So you got to join the grid. you got to get on this global system. Otherwise, if you're a lone country out there, you're a rogue axis of evil, and they're going to come get you. So this here cross-border mass murderers routine procedure for Turkey has been carrying out a very real genocidal campaign against the Kurd minority within and beyond its own borders for decades. This after early 1900s Armenian genocide, which the government of Turkey to this day still denies. We have Persian Gulf Council members to close embassies in Syria. All six Gulf Cooperation Council countries will close their embassies in Syria, citing the year-long violence in the country as the motive behind their decision. We're talking about U.S. Zionist-owned countries such as Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, and Kuwait. So, no big surprise. That was their motivation, they were told. Press TV chief in Syria denies email correspondence with Assad. The head of Iran's international news channel's offices in Syria has rejected allegations by some Western media that he was sent emails to Syrian president. He stated Western news channels were trying to falsify facts and fabricate news in order to embroil Iran and the Lebanese Hezbollah in Syria's events. He also emphasized that the recent CNN claims about uh, Mortada, excuse me, failing to respond to its context about the authenticity of the emails attributed to him were baseless as he was never contacted by CNN. He also rejected rumors that he was a businessman saying that I'm only a journalist and head of Press TV and al News Channel's offices in Damascus. Remember the exercise in Georgia, Russia calls it a uh, provocation, said the drills are supposed to be for suppression of riots. I told U.S. Secretary of State that this looks like provocation. So it says here that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is going to be in Tajikistan for an exercise and the Collective Security Treaty Organization is going to be training in Armenia. These are both uh, two big post-Soviet military blocs. And this is going to be a large-scale exercise. With a it's going to be a pretty big deal involving 24,000 troops taking in place a concerted Kremlin effort to gin up the threat from Afghanistan, prompting a lot of observers to speculate that Moscow was trying to use the exercise as a mean of exerting a heavier hand in Central Asia. And for what? Oh, for special anti-terror operations. For what? Oh, outlawed armed formations in the mountains. Exiled from the grid, North Korea rocket launch plan sparks U.S. threat that it could put much-needed food aid in jeopardy. Better get in line. Danny, Daniel Manning, Army soldier who leaked documents, aided al-Qaeda, says propaganda. A reporter says instead of being honored for exposing wrongdoing and corruption, he's being prosecuted. And a Marine's Tea Party Facebook page uh, test military rules was because he said he wouldn't follow unlawful orders. But that's why they're going to get rid of the troops and what? They're going to turn soldiers into cyborgs. This is GGN. Thank you.